Right. Okay. So, um, everybody, welcome to uh, the <clears throat> King's Maritime History Seminars, the latest installment. Welcome to uh, the Lawton Naval uh, Unit here in the Department of War Studies at King's College London, the School of Security Studies. Uh, gosh, let's do the whole let's do the whole works. Welcome to the Sir Michael Howard Center for the History of War, of which this is also a part. But of course, welcome to the series of seminars organized by the British Commission for Maritime History. A series of seminars uh, that are organized in association uh, with the Society for uh, Nautical Research and of course with the support of Lloyd's uh, Register. So uh, I have the pleasure uh, to uh, uh, Emma Cooper, who is um, got her own sort of technological arrangement, and I hope you can uh, see her down there uh, in the in the corner, ready to go. Emma's a familiar face uh, from the uh, King's uh, seminars back in the days when attendees had faces. Uh, yep. But I hope you re remember uh, hers. She's always uh, very welcome. Emma has a background uh, in furniture design and you know her work is is in a number of stork houses and uh, museums uh, around the place but uh, all the while she's had this uh, long interest uh, in the the men that were aboard uh, iconic uh, warship of course that you can you can see there but uh, and uh, everybody uh, everybody knows it but I don't think they know uh, the crews uh, so well, the men who are actually uh, there. And so it's an absolute delight uh, to welcome uh, Emma to uh, tell us uh, about, uh, about that. Uh, speaking about with the wonderfully uh, spare and mysterious uh, Trafalgar Temeraire, the men. Many thanks, uh, Emma. over to you. Thank you, thank you, here we go. The Trafalgar, Temeraire, the men. Whether you call her the Fighting Temeraire or the Saucy Temeraire, HMS Temeraire was a 98-gun warship built for the Royal Navy at Chatham Dockyard in Kent and launched in September 1798. Her name came from a French ship the British captured in 1759. Her size, give or take a few inches, was the same as HMS Victory. The Temeraire became famous for saving the victory at the Battle of Trafalgar. Turner's painting, The Fighting Temeraire, marks the end of her career. In 1838, after 40 years, the Temeraire was towed up the Thames to Rotherhithe, drawing large crowds there to be broken up, recycled, and parts of her turned into relics. Chairs, tables, barometers, picture frames, boxes, etc. Just to mention a few. And according to the newspapers, she was even used to make a wooden leg for one of her old seamen. The Temeraire, here's the Temeraire at Rotherhithe. The Royal Navy continued to use the name Temeraire for other ships and is now the name of a shore establishment at Portsmouth. The Fighting Temeraire has become so well known she is on our £20 note. But what made her so famous? Can a ship become famous without her men? On the 1st of November 1803, Captain Elliot Harvey was given a commission. He was to become captain of one of the Royal Navy's largest vessels. His Majesty's ship Temeraire. Captain Harvey had a strong character but if you read anything that sounds a bit negative just remember he was also a politician, the MP for Essex. Temeraire had been in ordinary at Plymouth since her last crew were paid off and left in September 1802. Having had repairs and a fresh copper bottom she was now ready to return to sea. All Captain Harvey needed was about 700 men. He had a handful of warrant officers, Boson, Carpenter and Purser. They came with the ship. But he needed a lieutenant to help run the ship. His first lieutenant, Thomas Fortescue Kennedy, a 31-year-old, 
from Soho in London was already known to Harvey, having served with him on board the Triumph from 1800 to 1801. In 1802, while still on the Triumph, Kennedy was accused of insulting a senior officer and court-martialed. He was found guilty and discharged from the service. The Temeraire's new surgeon was Thomas Caird, a 49-year-old from Montrose. He began his career in 1776, heading off as a surgeon's mate the American Wars of Independence. Captain Harvey would also need able-bodied and ordinary seamen, competent seamen who knew how to operate the ship. One of the ordinary seamen, Joseph Pinoz, came from a prison ship. He was 21 and born in Cadiz. Harvey would also need a chaplain to teach the young gentleman and for Sunday services. He'd need midshipmen to train and become future officers. Boys, these came in three classes. Volunteer first class, trainee midshipmen, aged about 11 to 13. Although Francis Harris, the gunner, had his son on board. In the books, he's 13, but actually, he was only eight years old. Their second class were the older boys, aged about 14 to 20 and third class with the younger boys aged about 12 to 16. Some of these were officers servants. One of the third class boys, William Braun, became a purser in 1812. they would also need Marines. Royal Marines had four headquarters. One of these was in Plymouth. The Temeraire ended up with a mixture of Plymouth Marines and Portsmouth Marines and Harvey would also receive 200 landsmen to train up and become future seamen. Two ships, the Andromach and Courageux, needed repairs at Plymouth, so these experienced men were spread around the fleet. Two of the Andromach men had been on the board the ship since 1793. The guard ship at Plymouth was the Salvador de Mundo. Most men who came to the Temeraire passed through the Salvador. Small transport vessels called tenders, often hired, would collect men from other ports and bring them to the Salvador. Now in one book, The Famous Fighters of the Fleet by Edward Fraser, it mentions Captain Harvey manned his ship to a large extent with Liverpool men. But this is very misleading. Using tenders, hundreds of men were being sent from the Princess, a ship at Liverpool, and taken to Plymouth. But these man, men came from all over, from the north of England, from Scotland, Wales, Ireland. And John Abraham, he was born in the Cape of Good Hope in South Africa. Only a handful came from Liverpool. We do have some men from Liverpool on board the Temeraire, for example, the master, William Price, and the captain of marines, William, Bisig William Simon Bissigny, but they didn't arrive by tender. The Marianne, the image the Mar of the Marianne, shows the room for impressed men. The Marianne was roughly the same size as the Bellina. The Bellina armed tender six guns carried 120 men at a time from Liverpool to Plymouth. The Blina had a crew of 15 men and also carried Lieutenant Grieg and his gang. The batch that left Liverpool on the 1st of December took nine days to reach Plymouth and out of 120 men they transported, the Temeraire received two. The second batch, 121 men, hit a few more problems which included storms, and their journey from Liverpool to Plymouth took 29 days. And of these, the Temeraire received 14. During this time, the tender, Rosa, making the same journey from Liverpool, was lost for six weeks. <laughs> Other tenders were coming over from Ireland, and some tenders were receiving their men from other tenders. 
In the book Landsman Hay by Robert Hay, there is a good description of tenders arriving at Plymouth in 1803. Young Hay had travelled down from Scotland. After a passage of three weeks from Greenock, we arrived at Plymouth and were immediately sent on board the Resilu, a kind of examination ship appointed to receive and cleanse all new levies raised at this port. After being thoroughly washed in a number of cisterns fitted around the side of the vessel, we were then examined in a state of nudity before a committee of surgeons. Those who had any appearance of disease or uncleanliness were kept on board for cure or purification. The rest, which I happened to be one, were sent on board the Salvador de Mundo. The tenders carried a good mix of volunteers and pressed men. If you volunteered, you received a bounty. Landsmen would receive one pound ten shillings, ordinary seamen two pound ten shillings, and if you were able-bodied or quarter gunner, you could claim five pounds. This was the time of the hot press, and many merchant ships and privateers lost their precious seamen. To see, the Temeraire came out of harbour on the 26th of February 1804. The weather was often stormy, sails ripped, bits fell off, and with over 200 new recruits on board, and modern phrase for this period would be a shakedown cruise. For the next 17 months, the Temeraire joined the Channel Fleet and blockaded the port of Brest in France. The Channel Fleet was under the command of Admiral William Cornwallis. In December 1803, it consisted of 18 sail of the line and 21 frigates. But by July 1804, it had grown to 35 sail of the night line plus the frigates. Ships would often return to Plymouth for fresh supplies and then they rejoined the fleet. <laughs> they would take with them live bullocks and fresh vegetables. And what did they drink? Lots of beer. The log also mentions wine and brandy, but beer was their main beverage. In August 1805, the Temeraire was sent to join the Mediterranean fleet, which was gathered, gathered near Cadiz, and would soon be under the command of Vice Admiral Horatio Nelson. Also gathered at Cadiz was the French and Spanish fleet. On the 20th of October 1805, Harvey mustered his men. This was usually done every seven to ten days to see exactly who was on board. Half the men on board the Temeraire were not Englishmen. But this was not unusual for the Royal Navy. The muster is not only a list of men, but also it lists their ages, where born, the details on who has been to hospital, on leave, led to other ships, run, died, and you can even see who was fond of tobacco. <laughs> now the Battle of Trafalgar, 21st of October, 1805. The Temeraire followed Nelson's flagship, HMS Victory, into battle. Running headlong into the enemy does have its dangers. By the time the Victory and the Temeraire reached the French and Spanish fleet, they had sustained a huge amount of damage. The victory ran up against the French Redoutable, and during a major fight, the French had gathered on their deck ready to board the victory. The Temeraire then came alongside the other side of the Redoutable and shot the men who had gathered on the deck. Soon after this, the French Fugjoy, 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 came up on the other side of the, de the Temeraire. These four ships became locked together in a desperate fight. Master at arms John Tuhig, a 35 year old from Cork, saved the ship when a French grenade 
nearly set fire to one of the Temeraire's powder magazines. If the magazine had exploded, this could have destroyed all four ships. The first ship to surrender was the Fugu. Fugu. Nearly all her officers were dead or wounded. She was boarded and taken by the first lieutenant, Thomas Kennedy, who was accompanied by James R. Scott, the, James, the master's mate, and Robert Holgate, one of the midshipmen, 20 seamen and six marines. Captain Lucas of the Redoutable would only surrender when he thought his ship was in a sinking state. She was taken by the second lieutenant, John Wallace and his men. This included Royal Marine, second lieutenant Samuel J. Payne, who was wounded in his face and hands, and Mr. William Pitt, midshipman, a 20 year old from London. During the boarding, William Pitt was shot in the leg from another vessel. And although a surgeon from the Redoubtable tried to save him, he died. Hundreds of men were killed or wounded on the two French ships. Some of the worst casualty rates for the British were on the Victory and the Temeraire. At the close of battle, the Temeraire found herself with two French prizes, or more accurately, two floating wrecks. All they needed to do was to get them somewhere safe, and then they could claim a good amount of prize money. The Temeraire had to find two prize crews, one for each prize. Forty-three men were sent to the Redoutable, and sixty-eight were sent to the Fugu. Fugu. Mm. Temeraire was badly damaged and had to be taken in tow by the Sirius. The day after the battle, the storm began in which many of the prizes were lost. The Redoubtable was taken in tow by the Swiftshore. At 10.15 on the 22nd of October, the Redoubtable, Redoubtable sank. Because of the storm, they couldn't get all the men off in time, and many men, both French and British, went down with the ship. On the 23rd, the Fugu sank again with the loss of many men. Fifteen of the men had a bit of a journey around the fleet. The Temeraire had sent 68 to the Fugu, and she had sank in the storm, with 44 men being rescued and 24 were lost. 17 of these was picked up by the Orion. They kept two and sent 15 to their Spanish prize they were towing, the Bahama. The Bahama was nearly lost in the storm, and the tow rope was put away. The Entrepreneur, the tiniest vessel in, with the, with the uh, British fleet, took 40 Englishmen out of a distressed hulk. Then they gave them, they gave 15 to the Euryalus, which belonged to the Temeraire. And then they got them back to the Temeraire on the 29th of October. In the week after the battle, the Temeraire found herself a bit short-handed. 84 dead, 73 wounded and 76 elsewhere in the fleet. She did gain some men, 127 prisoners of war. The Temeraire finally reached Gibraltar on the 2nd of November. 25 of the worst casualties were sent to Gibraltar Hospital. After some repairs, she limped back to Portsmouth. The remainder of the sick and wounded were sent to Haslar Hospital. Most of the wounded became unserviceable and left the Navy. The Temeraire would now need a rebuild and the remaining men paid off and sent to another ship. Some men and their families received help from the charity Lloyd's Patriotic Fund which depended much of your, on your class and how badly damaged you were. Lieutenant James Mould was slightly wounded and received £50. George Smith, Private, Royal Marine, was badly wounded and received £20. And Archibald Anderson, Landsman, slightly wounded, received £10. Although they lost their prizes, 
there was some prize money awarded. The Trafalgar Award list held at Portsmouth lists who received what. Captain Elliot Harvey, a first class, received £973. Thomas Price Master, second class, received £65, 11 shillings. And Archibald Anderson, landsman, fifth class, received £1, 17 shillings and sixpence. Captain Harvey was promoted to Rear Admiral after the battle. He was also a pallbearer for Lord Nelson's funeral. The Temeraire had eight lieutenants at Trafalgar. The first lieutenant, Thomas Fortescue Kennedy, was promoted after the battle to, to commander. He took part in the Walshren expedition in 1809 and in 1813 became a captain. He finally ended his days at Jersey, where he died in 1846. Two of the lieutenants were to be killed in boat accidents. Lieutenant William Asherton Smith died in January 1806, trying to save another boat in distress during a storm. Lieutenant Benjamin Vallock died in 1811, drowned in the bay of Avermond between Portugal and Spain, when they misjudged the currents. Lieutenant Alexander Davidson had a bad accident in 1806, which forced him to retire from active duty. Also in 1806, Lieutenant James Mould and Lieutenant Thomas Coakley joined their old captain, Rear Admiral Eliab Harvey, on the Tonnant. Lieutenant John Wallace, in 1807, joined the Derwent and the fight against the slave trade off the west coast of Africa. Now HMS Anson received 136 Temeraire men. For these men, a grim story was ahead of them. A naval action, a land action, an outbreak of sickness, and then a shipwreck, all within the next two years, by end of which about two thirds were dead or missing. A few Greenwich, few Greenwich, a few Temeraire men became Greenwich pensioners in their old age, the Navy equivalent to the Chelsea pensioners. Some were out pensioners, so stayed in their own homes, and some ended the days living at Greenwich Hospital. Now in 1848, the Naval General Service Medal was issued, a medal to commemorate naval battles and actions. 57 survivors of the Temeraire received a medal. This medal belongs to Richard Libertine, or Leverton, who ended his days at Greenwich Hospital and died at the age of 83. Not many men had six bars on their medal. Now, Archibald Anderson, landsman. Occasionally you find a wealth of records connected to one of the Temeraire men. Archibald Anderson is a good example of this. He appears in over 30 different documents. Not only do you have him in the muster books and pay books, but also in the allotment books, sending part of his wage back to his mother, Mary, in Greenock. He joined the Temeraire on the 3rd of December, 1803, volunteer, number 48 on the books, and having arrived by the Salvador. After Trafalgar, he appears on the Haslar Hospital musters, before he recovers enough to be sent back to sea. He joins the Gibraltar in 1806 and the ocean from 1812 to 14, still sending money back to his mother. In 1835, he was accepted into Greenwich Hospital, where he spent the rest of his life. In about 1848, he received his Naval General Service Medal he also appears in the 1851 and 61 census. Through the Greenwich Hospital documents, we learn that Archibald was born in Greenock in about 1778. He was single. His trade was a cooper. He spent 11 years in the Royal Navy 
described as blown up at Trafalgar and he was four foot, 11 and a half inches tall. He died and was buried at Greenwich on the 5th of January, 1865, aged 87. One of the longest careers was that of the purser, William Ballancourt. He became a purser in 1785 and spent 57 years in the Royal Navy. According to his will, he must have had a very successful career because he left a lot of money to his nephews and nieces. Buried at Perth in Scotland, he shares his grave with Sir George Ballancourt, military surgeon and medical pioneer. Now, John Hingston, St Ives, Cornwall, must have had one of the shorter careers. He joined the Royal Marines as a second lieutenant at Plymouth on October 1804. March 1805, he joined the Temeraire and on the 21st of October 1805, killed at the Battle of Action, aged 20. For the next 200 years, in all the books, papers and articles, relating to the casualties at Trafalgar, he is listed as Kingston with a K instead of Hinkston. Now spare a thought for these four men. They had joined the, uh, the Temeraire on the 14th of October, dropped off by the Am Amphion on board for one week. William Draper, Samuel Legrady, and Richard Hughes were all killed in action and Abraham Ricketts drowned, lost on the Redoutable. In the muster books there are no details of Abraham Ricketts, no age, place of birth, but one thing we have found out is he had been a prisoner of war. Now this is Simeon Edward Bassigny, Captain of Marines. He was born in Liverpool in 1763. He was the son of Victor and Catherine Bassigny. Victor was a Swiss immigrant who had become a successful merchant. He joined the Marines in 1779 at the age of 16 as a second lieutenant. In 1780, he was in action. The Flora captured Le Nymph, and at the end of the action, it is said that of the Marines, only Bassigny and his servant were neither killed nor wounded. It was mentioned in dispatches. Lieutenant Bassigny very much distinguished himself and his sword bore marks of his valour. He soon became quartermaster of the Portsmouth Division. In 1785 he settled down with Mrs Scallow, but it was short-lived. Mr. Scallow took the signet to court and received two pounds for damages. He became a first lieutenant in 1793 and a captain in 1797. While based at Portsmouth, Simeon Bassigny spent a lot of time recruiting in the Romsey area. At Romsey in Hampshire on the 3rd of February 1798, he married Anne de Man. In 1799, put on half pay, he auctioned his entire collection of household goods and furniture. They soon settled down on the Isle of Wight, where Bassigny went into banking. Messrs. Day, Bassigny and Day, and also started a family. They had four children, but lost one when they were very young. Bassigny also went into partnership with the brewery in Bath. He was then sent to Plymouth headquarters, where in 1804, he had his apartment burgled. On the 26th of February, 1805, he joined the Temeraire as captain of Marines. During this time on board the Temeraire, he was writing letters to his wife. These are now in New Zealand at the Auckland War Memorial Museum, along with his portrait. Captain Bassigny became wounded during the Battle of Trafalgar. It is said that he was one of the first casualties to be taken below. With the loss of his leg, he finally died two days after the battle on the 23rd of October. His wife and three children 
the youngest he never met, were helped by the Lloyd Patriotic Fund and awarded £25 a year. Now this is Christopher Halfpenny, landsman. Born in Dublin in about 1780, arrived in Plymouth on a tender and kept on board the Salvador de Mundo for four days. He joined the Temeraire as a volunteer in January 1804. He's in the log books, flogged on the 1st of May 1805, one dozen for drunkenness. In January 1806, he joined HMS Audacious, which sailed through a hurricane that year and was nearly lost. Between 1806 and 1811, he went from landsman to able-bodied, then to quarter gunner. In 1811, he joined Prince of Wales, where he became Gunner's mate. He left this ship in 1814. In 1814, the Royal Navy had major cutbacks. Now, in 1825, Christopher Halfpenny is on board the Wellesley, heading for Brazil. He joined the ship in 1804, a Portsmouth volunteer, and was now captain of the afterguard. At Rio de Janeiro, the Spartiot, the Trafalgar veteran, was in a sinking state. The Admiral, who was on board the Spartiot, had the two ships swap their entire crew. Christopher Halfpenny was now on a sinking ship, which needed taking back to Portsmouth. The ship's pumps were kept working day and night, all the way home. The logbook for this voyage was very damp looking, and the writing barely legible. When they reached Portsmouth, Christopher Halfpenny soon married with Maria Stone and settled down. Christopher acquired an out pension from Greenwich Hospital in 1830. In 1845, he received his Naval General Service Medal. He must have done quite well, as he also left his silver watch to Portsmouth Museum but sadly it was stolen in 1933. Christopher and Maria produced a family and he finally died in 1874 at the age of 92 and was buried at Kingston Cemetery in Portsmouth. For the Temeraire men who survived Trafalgar, there were to be other battles and actions, shipwrecks, some became prisoners of war, other faces pirates, smugglers and slave traders. There were court martials and civil courts, promotions and sickness. Some men, mainly the midshipmen, went on to join the Coast Guard. One man joined the Falmouth packet ships, another joined the post office packet ships, while other men returned to their civilian trades. Which leaves us with 711 men now, 711 men were on board the Temeraire at the Battle of Trafalgar. We are left with 711 very different stories. Thank you. Good. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's uh, fascinating. And of course, uh, you know, a, a, a lovely reminder that uh, you know, naval history that we we think we're all all familiar with is really nothing uh, without the without the men who were uh, um, involved and the people who who mm -hmm. possible. So uh, we're very grateful uh, for you uh, for that. I may have missed seven hundred and eleven men. How many of them survived? What the battle through the battle? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> that means <laughs> maths. Okay. <laughs> Well, never mind, never mind. But you, you it's it's been a, a labor of love tracing them all. Um, it's a, it's not a finished project. I'm no. still working on it, and it sort of brings up things every day. So, right. Um, <laughs> okay. Well, yes, yes. This is a, this is something that could uh, that could uh, no doubt go on uh, for uh, a, a, a lifetime. Yes. <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to have to point out uh, that uh, Professor Hugh Murphy was <laughs> reading. 
uh, and therefore uh, feels, I think we can forgive him for pointing out that it's not, it's green, it can not. Uh, I know, I know. Good My company apparently and everybody does it. No. <laughs> so, so that is just a, a, a good, uh, a good natured little reminder. Right. Uh, Jean uh, Spence um, I wants Hello, to know uh, about women. Were there any women on board or do you know of any evidence? Not that we know, mm, but okay. we don't know if there wasn't or was. <laughs> right, right, okay, okay, that's fair enough. Um, I might I might just say too that if anybody wants to, because um, this is this is the sort of topic that might you know remind people of stories uh, of of their of their own. If 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 you want to, I think I have the technological um, confidence now uh, that uh, I, I I could uh, invite people to raise their hands if they want to join and and be broadcast and to and to, and to, and to and to speak. Otherwise, we'll we'll carry on. There's another question. Uh, in the in the in the question and answers, this is from uh, Rohan, a, 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 a former student at, uh, at Kings. How, well, yes, and he wants to know how you how you've gone about piecing together uh, these stories. Where are you getting all of your information? How are you how are you spending your days? Um, Do I've been to the archives at London quite a lot. Um, during the lockdown, I joined Find My Past and look through all the old newspapers and find all my that sort past of. it's like our ancestry it's find my oh. past okay and that's been useful has it that has yes you can oh. access all the old newspapers and they have starting to put naval stuff on there mm -hmm. so and a lot okay. of the greenwich pension details are on there yeah and how, how much how much digging do you feel you're having to do uh, <laughs> I get excited by the, any tiny little information that I find. Yes, and I put it in a book and then gradually it builds. Yeah, that's the nature of historical research, isn't it? Yeah. You get uh, excited about these, these things. Um, G. Leslie um, wants to know um, uh, how HMS Wellesley came to be sunk in 1940. Surely a sailing ship would not be used in the war. Or it was, it was in the Thames, and they had been using it as a um, training school type thing. So they used to have the old sailing ships as like schools, didn't they? And right. Like, I'm trying to think the Conway was up near Liverpool and, and the Unicorn and a few of the others were used as training of boys. Right. Okay, very good. Um, and uh, this is a, a question from Jennifer Newbold then uh, wants to know, as I suppose we all do, how, how you got interested in, in, in these men, in particular, the story of the Temeraire. Did you, did you perhaps have an ancestor or something, uh, something like that? Not on the Temeraire. Oh. Um, I, I was interested in Trafalgar and we thought we'd start looking at the Temeraire as a start point. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it, that was about... 25, 30 years ago. Because you've been doing this for 25, uh, 30, 30 yeah, years. And you're getting on a bit. Yeah, I'm been tempted to, to, to broaden out to others, uh, other crews, or would that just open to, to too much? Well, I, I started with a few of the men. Then mm. a lot of them came off the Andromac, or Andromachy, whatever you call it. Mm. And I thought I'd stick to those. But then as you go along, you pick up others. And you think, oh, they were off the Temeraire, so you... Mm -hmm. to carry on and keep looking for we end up with all of them yeah so. of course of course okay uh davor Courage. uh what was the uh path for joining Tem temeraire for non-british sailors so were they volunteers or or or, or pressed so how did the non-british um i think they saw it as a job because you get paid mm. and you get your lodgings and your board so it was probably a job, but a lot of the foreign sailors got let off after the Battle of Trafalgar. I mean, you see them in the books going, um, discharge, being a foreigner. That only appears after the battle. Mm -hmm. okay. But there's a lot of Americans. A lot of Americans. Yeah, we had about 19 odd Americans. 
But I suppose if you don't have your paperwork, they could argue you, they don't know whether you are American or not. <laughs> okay. Um, an anonymous attendee mysteriously uh, is asking this. Were there many of any runaways in the, in, the, in the shakedown phase? And then as a, as, a, as a separate question, how would one go about working out the manpower that was needed for fighting a, a ship of the line? Um, what they mean is, you know, did they, did, 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 the, did they, the warrants and commissioned officers, get much choice over who they, who, who they received from the levies to fill, say, a lack of four top men, for example? So, um, I think they had a clear out from time to time, because they, they gave a couple of batches away to other ships. And you do mm -hmm. tend to wonder who they'd select to give to other ships. Mm -hmm. And we did have runners. We had about 20, 20 runners over the time span. Usually if the ship went into harbour, you sometimes get one or two disappear. But, okay. Um, and Peter Hoare has a question. Uh, Peter Hoare, to whom I've just uh, written. Um, you know. uh, did you use the Ashford Trafalgar role as an aid and did you find it accurate? There are a few mistakes. Not many, but just mm -hmm. one or two. Okay. And also in the some of the other lists, there there is men missing. Right. So it's on all these. When you get to a large list, you always get one or two points that you have to question. But it's just because of the size of the project. Mm -hmm. Okay. And Andrew Lambert tells us the Wellesley was sunk. Presumably by a Stuka, and I wonder if if, um, um, if 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 you Andrew want to uh, elaborate or 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 anybody uh, else uh, on their on their on their on their questions, or if they have anything else, as I say, I can um, entertain raised hands. I I I think otherwise. Let's see how we're getting on. A moment to gather their, their thoughts. Okay, so Ian Stafford has written. <laughs> now, let me. How do I know that? Um, just bear with me. Um, while I look for Ian Stafford, would you uh, entertain a question from Neil, Neil Danson? Have you been able to ascertain what proportion of the men were literate? It's an interesting question. Um, there are letters written, but whether they're... Well, I've, I've been looking at the wills. There's a lot of Navy wills, and about half I've found have the cross for signatures and half actually give it a go at uh, signing things. So, um, at a rough guess, there's quite a few literate ones, hmm? but actual numbers, I'll have, to, I'll have to sit and study them a bit longer. <laughs> okay. Now, I, I, I bragged about my newfound uh, technological confidence. Uh, it's evaporating uh, before my very eyes, but I think I saw that uh, Ian Stafford had raised a hand. Uh, I can't see evidence of it anymore uh, or any evidence of anybody else. Um, but what I'm gonna do is um, invite him to speak. Hello, so, can you hear? Hello? Yes, yes, we can, yes. Oh, okay. Well, I was just going to make a, a slightly wider question when the point about the Americans came up. Um, as to whether how many of them really were American, because if you recall uh, the Little War of 1812 and the issue of pressment which preceded that on the basis that many of them were actually British because uh, uh, they had been born in an American colony, uh, a British colony in America. Um, uh, I, and I just wondered whether uh, you know, we should take that into account, or are, uh, is the speaker certain that they were truly American? The only thing I can go by is what is in the muster book, mm. because a lot of them will say American or from Virginia or Newfoundland. Well, I know that's Canada, but <laughs> that's that's well, all I can go by. Is... 
and and then also Boston gets mentioned, either Lincolnshire or America. So, oh, it's just an interesting question. Uh, well, interesting mm. thought actually. That uh, yeah. it, it, you know, and the the, the other things like Canada, uh, they're not truly foreigners at this stage. That's the point. No, no. <laughs> I know I've been reading some of the American newspapers at the time and they were getting a bit shirty about the English pinching all their men. And uh, it's quite, re quite interesting to see their point of view because we were, we were bombing up and down the, the coast of America picking up people, so. Hmm. Right, and uh, Andrew uh, Lambert uh, is elaborating, uh, using a bomb on 24th of September 1940. She, Wellesley, was then named Cornwall and served as a reform school. So that's a little bit more. Uh, um, okay. Um, Michael Shaw wants to know, or knows, uh, that we, we, there are French emigres serving on some British ships at, uh, at Trafalgar and wants to know if there were any on the Temerac. Yes, yes. One, one, Peter Cherry, he ended up as a Greenwich pensioner, so we know quite a bit about him. Oh, okay. Uh, so, yeah, there's about three, I think. There was four, but one ran away. So. One ran away. Okay, very good. Um, what, Kevin Stoll, what colour ensign did she fly at the battle? Red, white or blue? <laughs> All ships carry uh, uh, <laughs> the same colour in a in a squadron. Is the question? Uh. <laughs> or is it the men, not the flags? That, uh, yes. not the, the, yeah. Okay. All right. Then I'll I'll, I'll, I'll have to look up that. <laughs> I'll I'll park that that one. Um, and then um, and then the anonymous again. Um, here we are. Uh, from a naval architecture perspective, so we're getting some clues about the identity of this person. Uh, what advantage had uh, Temeraire, the ship itself, uh, over the Redoutable and the Fougue? It was going to be my guess at the pronunciation. Um, a, classic, a classic argument for the success of uh, at Trafalgar was the direct tactics and superior seamen and gunnery. Were there more material advantages? So from a naval architectural point of view, any advantages of the Temeraire? Uh, over its uh, adversaries. And it was taller. Um, okay. I mean, both the French ships were a lot smaller than the two British ships, which must have made, right. had an effect. Okay. Um, thank you. And uh, Peter Pohor, I'm not surprised, knows uh, it was the white ensign that you followed. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Um, uh, Jane Bowden Dan sends her thanks. Um, can you please say something about the repairs the Temeraire needed after Trafalgar, uh, presumably in Gibraltar, and, and, and were some men put ashore for treatment uh, in the Royal Naval uh, Hospital at Gibraltar? Yes, about 25 went to Gibraltar Hospital, the worst of the casualties. Although, I mean, some of the, they, they put two lists together of um, badly wounded and slightly wounded. But you do get deaths on on both lists, so I don't know how they categorise the different lists. But yeah, about twenty five got sent to Gibraltar, and the rest got sent back to uh, Aslar near near Portsmouth. Okay, um, thank you, Helen Jackson. Um, was it difficult to identify how many men were pressed uh, rather than volunteers? That's one thing I'm doing the... at the moment. What's that? There's a lot of them. Hmm? Well, there's more to the question. I just hadn't finished. Oh, sorry, sorry. I, it's my, my fault. I'm, I, I'm being clumsy here. If the men were offered the volunteers' bounty after being pressed, do they show up on the register as uh, our volunteers? Is, is the follow-up question. Um, so, what do we well, know the, about the, pressed versus volunteer? The, there is there is on the on the musters usually it lists whether they're volunteer or pressed. So mm -hmm. there's a way of tracing who was pressed and who was volunteered, which I'm working on at the moment. So I didn't get it done in time. <laughs> okay, well, no, well, I can't do, uh, well, I can't do everything, especially with uh, uh, a lifetime uh, subject uh, like, uh, like this. Okay, um, is there anybody else who would like to uh, speak? Because I think we've, we've uh, mastered uh, that. 
um, because um, oh, you might not have seen Emma, but uh, Valerie Wilson Trower is uh, as remind us the larger ship should have been uh, faster. Otherwise, um, I'll look for raised hands or or, or questions. I think um, you can all agree uh, that this has been very interesting, very fascinating uh, 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 talk, very uh, fascinating insight into the, into the lives of the people uh, behind the stories with which uh, we're uh, uh, familiar. Um, so it's uh, with uh, great thanks and with the promise of a, of a, of a proper a uh, glass of wine next time you're down uh, in, in London. Yeah, maybe uh, a, a bite to eat with some of the people who are there on my list of attendees on the right, but not uh, sadly uh, here uh, in person. Yes. So thank you very much, uh, Emma. And uh, I think, uh, and and yes, and the Keith Harcourt uh, and, and others are, are sending in uh, their, their thanks uh, as well. Thank you. Thank you very much for attending um, and uh, in, in such uh, such numbers. Uh, I will hope to see you all next on the 22nd of uh, April when we have uh, Roger Dents um, talking about um, uh, ships. I don't have it in front of me, but the Russo Japanese War um, that promises also uh, to be a good one. Thank you very much, Emma, and uh, goodbye to uh, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you. <laughs>